Thanks for joining us in this hour. You've just been seeing how video gaming technology is impacting entertainment in enormous ways. Now learn how it's impacting news. Brian Chiang is takes us out, takes over from here. Hi, Brian. Hey, Shep, thanks so much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Next Level Summit panel on the tech revolution in news. Live from Studio 3A, I'm Brian Chung, business and data reporter for NBC News. And from political coverage to reporters in the field, new technology is revolutionizing the art of storytelling. And today, we're going to give a behind-the-scenes look at how we're evolving the way journalists deliver the news. In the next hour, you're going to be learning about some of the coolest new tech jobs from the experts leading this innovation and what you'll need to know to maybe land one of them. We've got a lot of ground to cover this hour, how news is using gaming technology and drones, the magic behind Steve Kornacki's renowned big board, and we'll be heading back out to our reporters with students in Washington, D.C. and Arlington, Texas. And by the way, as is the case with the last panel, if you have any questions at any time during the program, post them in the Q&A tab and we'll make sure to get through them throughout the discussion. But of course, we'll start right now with our esteemed panel here with me on set, Mark Greenstein, who is the Senior Vice President of Design and Production for NBC News and MSNBC, as well as Alex Bassett, who's the Senior Director of Production Technology. Both of you are here to uh, talk a little bit about some of these really cool innovations that we're seeing in real time in our industry. So we're gonna talk about AR, VR, AI, alphabet soup of stuff that's really <laughs> changing the way that journalists are delivering the news. Welcome to both of you. Um, Mark, I want you to start off big picture here. What are the types of tech that we're deploying here? How does it kind of fit into the you know, news and, and storytelling that we're doing yeah. here at NBC? Well, thanks for having us. I mean, I'll start by saying what technology has done is just made all of this so much more accessible, both on the consumer side and for the journalist. So I think on the consumer side, what we're seeing is there's just so many platforms to find our content on. And our strategy is to make sure that we meet people where they want to view us. And what that means for us as journalists is that we could tell our stories in so many different ways, our traditional newscast, uh, nightly or Today Show, um, the cable news format of headlines, breaking news and analysis, also on streaming, uh, excuse me, with NBC News Now. And then, of course, on short form. I mean, we're all over social media, and we could then tailor our content for those platforms as well. And then uh, from a journalist standpoint, you know, I joke around. They call it phones and drones, right? <laughs> There's just so many new ways that we could sit there with our phone and immediately get to air and shoot high-quality 4K content with an iPhone. Mark, is gonna, Mark Weinstock, who later on, is going to show us a great demo of how we're using drones to capture content um, and to show perspectives as a story that we could never do before without that technology. But it extends beyond that. We can now um, transmit from all across the globe without these massive infrastructure that we used to have to carry with us. <laughs> Um, and we're starting to bring in a lot of consumer technology, you know, uh, Zoom, FaceTime, you know, platforms like everyone's watching us on now. We're able to bring guests on that way, which, you know, expands the number of people who could contribute to our broadcast, again, without that big heavy lift of what the traditional sending a satellite truck um, to your house is. And of course, graphics. I mean, Annie just did a great explanation of, you know, how people are using this new gaming technology, Unreal, um, to create these immersive environments. And so unlike film, we want to use these this immersive gaming technology so that we could show you different parts of a story. So we could better illustrate um, something that maybe recently happened, the recreation of an event, or uh, describe, I think you'll see later, um, the Artemis rocket, uh, mm -hmm. and how we could use it for other types of storytelling. Yeah, and you know, when we talk about the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, that's a little mm -hmm. bit different than maybe in the, in the news world. And I guess, Mark, you know, walk us through some applications that we've already seen for breaking news stories or things that you know, we're covering on a day-to-day -day basis, like, for example, politics, right? Yeah. There, there's a lot of application, I imagine, for those types of things for that type of news coverage. Yeah, well, look, I'll go a little history lesson, and I think <laughs> elections and politics is just a good example of how technology has helped change the industry, right? So if you look back to the 50s, you know, the first time that, you know, television really started covering presidential elections, it's basically black and white video, you know, guys sitting in a big room and then literally writing down numbers on cards and the camera zooming into it. And then, of course, you know, television graphics started coming, so the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, the traditional graphics. And we felt, somewhere around 2004, we felt like something was missing, like this tangible thing. It was all graphic when there was nothing real. So we did Democracy Plaza, what you're seeing here, um, where we literally lit up this giant building we're sitting in and put physical elements on the building to help explain um, the election story. 
so we had our graphics, we had this physical experience, and we said, could we mix those two things mm -hmm. together? And so then the evolution became AR, VR. So in 2012 and 2014, we did Democracy Plaza, and we took the physical building and then added all these amazing AR, VR elements to it so that we could better explain the election story. And I think that's exactly what Annie was talking about and where the rest of the, the film industry is going now. It's we're trying to create this immersive environment using physical sets, physical LED walls, and these augmented and virtual graphics so we could better story tell with. Yeah, and you mentioned kind of the interactivity of both the AR and the VR here. And, and I want to bring Alex into the fold here because you're going to walk and talk literally yeah. here in studio to show us about exactly how those things blend together. Tell us about what we're looking at right here in 3A. No problem, Brian. So again, rather than tell you nothing better than a show and tell in a studio, <laughs> right? So there's four components to virtual production in a live environment. The first is our traditional studio infrastructure. So above me, we have all our lights. This illuminates our talent and our environment. The second is our studio cameras. We set up in a multi-camera setup, which allows us to cut to different angles in a traditional studio. And we want to leverage that in a virtual environment. And the way we do that is our second piece, which is our tracking unit. Every camera in the studio has a tracking camera installed, which emits an infrared signal. This goes up to the ceiling. And up in the ceiling, we install hundreds of reflective stickers, which allow each camera to know which point of reference it has. Once those are installed and calibrated, we take this tracking unit and we literally walk around the studio and scan the whole environment. That allows us to have a star map and each studio has a unique constellation, which allows every camera to get a unique perspective of whichever virtual environment we are showing. The third piece is the renderer. As Mark referenced, it's Unreal Engine that we use. This uh, is used by our technical artists and our creatives to build the immersive environments that you see on air. The fourth piece and final is the, is the virtual canvas. As you saw before with our film unit, they use LED technology, much like we have around us here. We also have the ability to do augmented reality, which is placing graphics in a physical space, much like on Democracy Plaza. And then the final piece is a green screen set extension, which you can see behind me now. Once we combine all these elements together, you allow to see behind me the Artemis rocket, which allows a set extension to improve storytelling. But there's one more trick. As the camera pushes past me, we have a unique technique that allows us to do a handoff and fly around the environment. That's the tour, Brian. That is so cool. And you can see, again, that rocket. It's in our studio, even though, of course, you can't fit a rocket inside of this studio. But you know, all of this raises just really interesting questions over how you kind of put together a production with all of these new elements that just simply didn't exist in the industry even 10 years ago. So uh, let's bring in our director, uh, Josh Haskins, who uh, is in the control room, who can chat with us a little bit about how he thinks about all of these things and how to put together all of these elements. And, and Josh, you know, these are cool things that you can play with when Take. putting together something. How do you decide how to put these elements together in, in blending both alternative reality and actual reality into the same broadcast? Well, thank you very much, Brian. And thank you very much, Mark and Alex, for the explanation. Welcome to 8H Control Room, home of SNL. I'm here with Brian, uh, RTD, another Brian. Um, there's a lot of tech in here. VR, AR, it's a game changer, obviously. The first and 10 line, if you know that from football, is a good example of AR that was implemented uh, more than a decade ago. And here we are now creating whole immersive environments. Uh, we bring uh, the producer's vision to life. Uh, this is the room where we composite the graphic over the green screen technology, just as you saw from Alex's great explanation. Um, it's exciting time to be in television, Brian, uh, and I'm gonna toss it back to you so I can get back to work. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, please do get back to work. By the way, I love the producer cam. I feel like we should definitely yes. take advantage yeah. of that more often. It's so cool. Let's, um, let's come back here to 3A though, and, and Alex, I want you to kind of uh, walk in. You know, I feel like I kind of raced through the, the, the alphabet soup of things, right? AR, VR, XR, sure. AI. Can you just walk us through exactly what those acronyms mean and, and, and explain what each utility is for what we're doing here at NBC. Sure, so XR is extended reality. Again, traditionally that's using LED technology, much like the film unit, unit use. Mm -hmm. um, again, that allows an extension either using LED and then extending away from it and building those attachments. Secondly, we have VR, which is virtual reality. 
generally in a green screen. Kind of a broad term, kind of what just gets thrown around about the experience that we use. And then AR is placing graphics in real environments, which is historically what we've done in elections. Um, we use real cameras, we track those, and then we overlay those. And then AI is something that we're exploring and is becoming more and more prominent, and it's artificial intelligence. And what that does is, in the way Mark and I, I think, approach it, is to supplement journalist skills, right? So take away some of the busy work, automate some of those things, but allow the decision making and the creative and editorial to remain with the people. Yeah, I mean, a, a good example of that on the, on the technical front here is we're using this technology for prompter, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what the, the technology is doing is the prompter will scroll to you reading a script automatically, but then it learns language. It learns if I'm the producer talking to it saying, hey, go to the next story, go to page A3. Over time, it has machine learning, so it picks up on my vernacular. So that, you know, the first time it may not get what I said, right? But then the next two times it will. And it will continue to learn that. And I think when you drag that technology out, again, how do we use that to help tee up functions which were either largely very technical in nature mm -hmm. or just to offer up ideas for journalists just to cut through some of the, the um, the time it would take to get to that end decision anyway. Yeah, we've seen Siri get so much better already. That's so, it. you know, we're, we're basically already there. You know, I want to go back to what we just showed with the, the, the rocket in that green screen just in our studio here. Yeah. That's something that we have all actually applied in, in, in live broadcasting, right? I mean, we're, we're yeah. using that in a live broadcast. Yeah, so like, it, that's exactly what's right. What's the lead time for that? You know, so this one we actually put together in a few weeks, um, you know, and, and the lead time, it could be a day, it could be months, right? And I think on the film side, you'll see a much longer lead time for what they do than what, what our timelines will be in news. But, you know, the idea here was to give Lindsay, who you see, um, you know, and she pops clip. up on the jet bridge yeah, now. Yeah, she <laughs> pops up in different places. But the idea was just to have her do an explainer of what are the different pieces that make up Artemis. Like, what is the SLS rocket? What's the Orion crew capsule? And then how does it compare to previous elements that were in space? Um, so we sort of timeline or we, we storyboarded it, came up with what we, she wanted to talk about, and then it probably took us about two to three weeks to actually put it together. Um, I believe we, we shot this live to tape. Um, the only reason we taped it, honestly, was for scheduling reasons. We mm -hmm. didn't know when Artemis but was But you can do this live. It. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what Alex just did, you know, where you saw him go in, and, and that's the idea for the technology, is to integrate it into what we're doing in a live environment. Um, and there was no editing on that clip we just rolled. I mean, that was a single live take. So, uh, you know, Alex, you showed us about how all these elements come together. I mean, Mark was just talking about how the planning is such a big part of this, yeah. right? I mean, when you think about news events that are coming up, right, the midterms are coming up in a few weeks. You have a presidential election coming in another two, two years. There's weather events. I imagine you could put this technology to as well. You know, do you try to figure out in, in advance, hey, here are ways that we can apply this technology such that we can kind of get the reps at some point. You could be using this type of technology on, on a snap to apply to a breaking news situation. Yeah, so more time is always better, right? But we, <laughs> right. we work in news, so it's ever changing. But we use those, those midterms and those elections as landmarks. So it's basically as soon as this one ends, we will already start segueing into what we want to do and how we want to make it better every two years. Um, the, the testing is obviously extensive, many long days, many long nights, um, and then just getting in here and validating that all those technical elements are working, and then working with the directors and the creatives to say, this is how it works, this is how you should use it, and then getting feedback from them on how they want to use it and how they want to story tell. Those, and then representing that data accurately, especially in elections, is so important for us. So we have to have it quick, we have to have it fast and reliable, which is obviously a pretty big target to hit, right? <laughs> right. Like, but um, historically, we've been very good at executing that, and we kind of pride ourselves on, on building on top of everything we've learned. I, I could also say, you know, for breaking news, we have used Unreal for it in the past. And mm -hmm. so Unreal isn't just augmented virtual and extended reality. In the end, it is just a graphic renderer, right? So uh, the January 6th uh, insurrection, we actually did a recreation of where the mob went throughout the Capitol, and we, we did it virtually in real time and then put it in one of Richard Engel's mm -hmm. pieces within days. Um, which led to a longer form project that we did after that. But it was the right tool for the job just to make a 3D representation of the Capitol so that we could storytell and give people an idea of how did the events flow over the course of that day, even without the augmented and virtual. Whereas in the past, you would have had to just use a map or something like exactly that. So, right. you know, definitely cool applications there. Uh, we've got a question from the audience on the execution, actually, that you were just talking about, Alex. So uh, this question comes from Tyrell, and the question is, if a camera's angle needs to be changed, does the virtual environment need time to render that change, or 
Can it be done in real time? It can definitely be done in real time. If it wasn't, I wouldn't have a job anymore. <laughs> so um, what happens is the, the graphics only rendering what the camera sees. So each camera has a unique graphic engine associated with it. Mm -hmm. So it's only rendering what that camera is seeing at all time. Mm -hmm. So there's no, we may pre-bake in some of the elements like the lighting and things that are uh, environmental. But anything you see is rendering in real time because, because of the live data part, especially in elections, we have to obviously represent that as the numbers come in. So there's no way of us doing any of that. Yeah, when we talk about camera angles too, we were actually using a jib to fly into that green screen that you just showed us. So there actually is a lot of movement happening yeah. as you're putting those and projecting those elements in, into exactly. the broadcast. Um, you know, I want to ask kind of just about the career trajectory here, right? When both of you came into the industry, it's possible that these types of things just simply didn't exist. Yeah. What have you, have you been surprised by the development of kind of all this tech? Because there might have been some people 20 years ago who said, the news is going to be the news. You read the prompter, you put yeah. the full screens up, you put the VO of the, of, of, the, of the photos or videos that are relevant, and that's it. Yeah, I, I mean, look, with AR and VR have been around, you know, for a while. I, I think it's recent years, specifically with this Epic engine, the Unreal engine, um, that have made it to a level that we really want to use it more because um, it does allow us to storytell in such a dynamic way. It no longer feels like a cartoon. It feels like we can um, bring the story to life. And also, you know, consumer habits have changed, right? Like gaming is a much bigger thing. The metaverse is a thing. Um, so for us to ignore this technology and not to try to put it in seems like the wrong strategy. Um, but, you know, definitely it, it does make us think differently. It's no longer, to your point earlier, let's just make a flat graphic and call it a day. It's, well, what else can we do? Um, but it's exciting for us to try. And look, we, we have a lot to learn here. Like we've just started down this path. Um, but for me, that's actually the most exciting part is to see what are we going to be able to do with this in the next few years. Alex, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, virtual, again, as Mark said, it's, it's not a new concept. Historically, it was usually standalone. And especially, it's been around in Europe a long time. Back when I lived in London, we used to use it all the time in, 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 as a siloed environment. But the blending of the two realities, that's, that's really the, where we're moving because it's the storytelling piece. Historically, it would be, how do I build this studio? And now it's, well, how do I add to this studio and give us a canvas to tell stories? You had to build this studio to accommodate a lot of these yeah. things, right? Uh, tell me about the planning that went into that. I mean, it's not, it's not cheap stuff to put <laughs> into uh, a studio, not. is it not? Yeah. yeah, certainly not. So yeah, when we, when we designed the studio, it was about, I guess, a year and a half old at this point uh, in its latest incarnation. You know, we knew that AR, VR, XR was gonna be a big part of it. You know, so the first thing, which we know is temporary, honestly, you know, was the green screen. And then what, what you don't see is there's actually doors there which open up the green screen or close it off. They're huge doors. Um, they're huge. They're huge. Um, and the guys who move it, I'm sorry, I make you do it 10 times a day. <laughs> but, you know, it enables us to turn that technology on or off visually, right? Um, so we knew that was part of the planning. And then also all the LED screens that you see around us right now. You know, this just gives us such a dynamic way to change the environment. Mm -hmm. Like right now it's Academy, and in a few hours from now it's going to be Nicole Wallace, and a few hours after that will be Chris Hayes and Alex Wagner, right? Yeah. And, and so knowing that we wanted the flexibility, that we wanted to create this multi-use space. And the last thing which you saw during Alex's tour is just on top of all the cameras, the camera tracking. You know, that was a big investment. Um, and how we had to place different items to make sure that as the cameras moved around the studio, they would be properly tracked so mm -hmm. that all the augmented and extended reality graphics followed along. Yeah, and a quick note anecdotally on the, on the screens that we have behind us, there's one shot for MSNBC, I believe, that has a staircase. Yeah. And my mom texts me, she goes, I thought that was a real staircase in there. I'm like, <laughs> no, mom, it's just the studio. It looks so good. Uh, let's turn now to a question from a student at Florida International University. Uh, let's play that question. My question is, how do you think new technologies will impact the way we report on tragedies like Hurricane Ian's impact on Western Florida? Mark, you have a response to that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think again, it's, you know, can we show, like weather graphics are the simple example, right? We've seen weather graphics get so much more dynamic over the years. Um, not only just in the technology of being able to follow the storm path and all of that, but just even in the way that we can show like the storm surge. And we, we did this on today's show uh, last year, actually. You know, I forgot what the, the numbers were, but we were showing what does a six foot, 10 foot storm surge look like? And we used AR, VR to illustrate that story. Um, so we didn't do that in the most recent hurricane, but I think those are the ways with weather uh, that we could better illustrate. And I guess, you know, that kind of makes sense because when we talk about hurricanes, right, you have the map of where the projected path could be. You have the storm surge application like that as well. You know, I think the rocket is one of them, but are there other types of maybe applications for these types of things that we're not thinking about that you feel like could be 
yeah. cool ways to apply this stuff in the I, future? It's a nebulous question. But. It's, it's nebulous. I mean, I think that, look, it's endless, right? It's, it's what makes the most sense. I think when I look at a show like today, um, you know, we have daily opportunity because what are we trying to do there? We're always trying to create environments and moods. You know, we're cooking, um, you know, spaghetti today and, right. and, and something else tomorrow. How do we create that mood that fits that segment? Um, when you talk about uh, commerce, right, is there a way that we want to, because we do a lot of products uh, on today's show, um, how do we better illustrate what that product is? Is there some virtual thing that you see that's here's what the shoes look like on me, um, meaning we extend it out to the audience? Um, so I think there are endless ways just, you know, uh, even on those very simple things um, that we could use it. And then, of course, environmental, which is a lot of what Annie was showing in the film division. How do we make these studios feel like they match the stories we're trying to tell, whether it's election night or it's storm coverage um, or it's just our everyday news to the point of your staircase? Uh, <laughs> we, love, we love the staircase. The staircase is great. We love the staircase. Uh, we've got another question from the audience. The question is, what was one of the major unforeseen challenges that you found with technology changing so quickly? Are there any? I'm sure none. There, yeah, yeah. No problems at all whatsoever. Yeah. Alex, why don't you tell us what the... Uh... Uh, yeah, so one is staying current, right? Because we're a big company. NBC is you know, a very large organization. And so we have to scale, right? So we have to build out systems and the kind of uncool stuff that comes with the graphics, which is infrastructure and deployment and all the things that come along with that. So that, and then accessibility for producers to be able to say, hey, I want this graphic in my rundown. I can build and save a template. So that, that's some of the just general workflow challenges. As I mentioned, time would always be more, we'd always love more of that. But then for us, this is a live studio, you know, all day, every day. Um, in, the, in the movie business, they have time to set up, shoot shots, and do it. These cameras fly around their studio all day, every day. And one thing about tracking is, you know, if, if they crash or they bump into something, if that offsets by a few millimeters, the whole illusion can, can come apart. So w there's a lot of retesting, recalibrating, and, and a fine tuning that makes it feel real and, and believable. And the other piece is the education piece, right? We're all learning this technology. So our artists who traditionally have never worked in Unreal now need to learn it. And whereas they're excited about it, there's obviously that curve. And as you know, news doesn't stop. So you know, I'm one of those people like, come on, we got to go, we got to go. Mm -hmm. But we need to leave time so that we can train and have them understand and learn the technology. Uh, and then the other piece of it is, especially with some of the AR, VR stuff, there is no playbook. I mean, all of us, you know, we have a, a monthly call across NBC Universal simply talking about this technology because there's no out of the box solution. <laughs> so we're all right. making it up um, and we're learning from each other, but you know, it, which is fun, except it's frustrating when you are trying to get something on air. It's like, we know we want to get Artemis on air because it could take off any day, but I don't really know where to start. And so there's been a lot of just trial and error in all of this. And with how fast things are moving, maybe you should make that a, a weekly call. Um, but Honestly, <laughs> I know. but with Artemis, we probably have another year. So we <laughs> might be okay. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the career path because again, we have a lot of young professionals, students that are watching this very closely. What are the types of new tech jobs that they should be, be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, look, if you want to be an artist, obviously I would tell you learning 3D and even taking some architectural design courses would probably be a good thing to learn. Um, because we see more and more of the industry moving towards this uh, extended reality technology for visual effects. And so understanding something beyond just the two-dimensional space is really important. Um, and then, of course, everything is driven by, you know, computing and engineering. Uh, and I think we've seen that, you know, television engineering is shifting so quickly. It is moving, you know, into this era where you certainly need to understand, you know, front-end and back-end systems in a way that maybe 10, 15 years ago you didn't. Um, I think we have another question down in Washington, D.C. We're going to head down to Howard University, where NBC's Emily Aketa is standing by with some students who have questions for us. Uh, Emily, what have you got for us? Uh, Emily, what have you got for us? Hey there, Brian. You know what I love about this group of students? They really, there's this wide array of interests. We've got students in the School of Communications, the School of Engineering, because so much intersects with technology. So let's go to a computer science major, uh, Anirudh Pokhrel. And I know you're really curious about the broader impacts of advancing technology. Yes. Yeah, so um, as we know, technology is heavily adapted in the media industry. So my question is, is there a fear among media personnel of losing their jobs? as their work is uh, now e done easier and faster with the help of technology, uh, machine learning, AI. So is there a fear in the industry? Anyone want to uh, take a stab at that uh, question? Yeah, I guess, I guess the way I'd frame it is we don't, like our mandate and the way Mark and I approach this is it's to supplement and take away some of the busy work. That, so to free people up to do 
in design more creative work, in, in engineering to free up deployment, getting these things on machines, we use automation there. But in terms of core competency and skill set, we still require all of those things. This is still a TV production facility. We still require specialisms. Video and lighting is one of the hardest jobs I think that exists. That's the reason that we all look, well, at least Brian and Mark look good and I don't, <laughs> right? So I, I, those specialisms and, and that unique skill across anything, uh, we're always going to need that level of expertise to achieve a high-end product. Yeah, and look, I'll add to it just by saying, look, jobs are going to shift. We see it in every industry, and we're not unique to that. Um, you know, so whereas in old days, every camera was, you know, a manually operated camera, that's still prevalent across the television business. But certainly in, in areas like this and in this studio where we have robotic cameras, you know, there was a bit of training that needed to happen. Can I run a manual camera, but can I also run a robotic? Um, and you look at drones, you know, our, our field crews who, you know, best in the business. You know, in the old days, they're lugging around these giant cameras with these humongous tape machines with them. You know, now they have these small little things and also could fly drones on the side. Um, so I think it's more of an evolution, a skill set. Yeah, and we've got a lot of cameras here just in 3A, and some of them are robotic, but we have a massive crew here in studio with us as well to put this production together. So right. it's not entirely all robotic, at least not, at not, not yet. Um, Mark and Alex, thanks so much. Uh, you're going to hang with us. Uh, and again, our panel is going to stick with us throughout the hour. But we want to move on to another really cool, cool piece of technology that we're using here at NBC. But again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, Post them in the Q&A tab. We'll make sure we'll get to as many of them as we can in the second half of this panel. But let's talk a little bit about the big board. If you've paid attention to elections on our platforms, you will have certainly seen this. None other than Steve Kornacki, the man himself, is here to share the magic behind the tech alongside Sam Swartz, NBC News senior software engineering manager. Uh, Steve, some powerful data in there. I've used that thing before. It's a little intimidating. Walk us through everything that goes into the big board and how it works. Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Brian. Great to be with you. And I mean, yeah, this is sort of, we're three weeks out from the election, so I feel like I'm surgically attached to this thing at this point. We got all sorts of data, all sorts of uh, elections all over the country. We're getting ready to track on election night. But the thing is, when it comes to this, from my perspective, it is sort of like, you know, driving a car. I, I know to get in the driver's seat, do the steering wheel. I have no idea how it all works. And that is where Sam Schwartz comes in here. Uh, Sam, first of all, maybe just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what it is you do here. Yeah, sure. So I'm Sam, and I'm a senior engineer here. So I uh, actually joined NBC in 2018, and I started working on the midterms actually on our digital side of the house. Uh, I liked it so much that I ended up deciding, why not manage some teams that also work on politics? So now I manage two engineering teams here. So I work on one team with digital and then obviously one team with broadcast. And we, we build all this amazing stuff that we then use for telling election stories. So, so tell us, uh, maybe back up a step here, how, how it is that you got into this kind of field to begin with? What's, what's the origin <laughs> story here? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was completely by accident. Uh, I went to college to become a classical opera singer. My parents <laughs> were thrilled, obviously. Uh, they encouraged me to double major, and luckily for me, my alma mater actually had a really unique major called Interactive Multimedia that had a combination of journalism and design and also software development. So I think probably, I want to say it was like somewhere around my sophomore year, I had to decide between taking another music history class or doing some stuff with programming and building things. And I really did not want to take another music history class. It kind of just decided itself, I think, at that point. Ultimately, it was an easy choice. And it's, it's been something that I've been in love with ever since. Uh, you ever think about what could have been as an opera singer? You know, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm OK leaving that one behind, honestly. I think, I think I'm. I'm really happy. I'm still able to do all the things that I'm passionate about, so it's it's all good there. Uh, it worked out good from our end, and I also know it's a dilemma I personally have never faced in my life and <laughs> probably never will. So let's take a, a closer look at some of the things we can do with the board here. Here's something, it, it, looking ahead to election night in a couple of weeks, obviously battle for control of the House is going to be a major story. So what you're looking at here, these are all 435 districts around the country. Let's just zoom in and kind of give you an example of some of the stuff we can do with this, will be doing on election night. Here we go. This is the 34th district of Texas. This is deep in South Texas. I think this is a really interesting storyline itself. We'll certainly be spending a lot of time on election night talking about, but just in terms of what we're able to do with the board here, you know, a couple things jump out. First of all, in any district around the country, so here we go, Texas is 34th. We'll have the results as they come in, and one thing we'll be able to do is right away say, well, how do these results tonight, there will be numbers here election night, match up with 
the 2020 presidential election results from that district. It gives you a really good basis for comparison. And you can even go further back in time and see the trends. And that's one of the stories in South Texas. The trend from 2016 to 2020, it favored the Republicans. And you can even then go a step further, break it down to the county level within the district. This is one of my favorite things. And again, you can see the trend match it up with how it's going. How to tell us like behind the scenes to get sure. this level of data, this precision, how does that happen? So, I mean, we work really closely with the decision desk to make all of these numbers happen. Obviously, I mean, we've already heard it before. We need to be fast, we need to be accurate. So it's really important that when we're showing this data that it's correct. So additionally here with the counties especially, that's something we work really closely with the decision desk on because this is not necessarily something that you're just going to find. You know, we need to model this, especially because the congressional districts have shifted since 2020. So we need to work really closely with them. And it's, it's always a really intricate process to make sure that we're absolutely giving the most up-to-date, the most accurate information. So it's, it's really a partnership to get all this data on the screen. So that way you can tell the story at the end of the day. Yeah, no, I don't envy you guys this year because as you say, redistricting, the redrawing of all the lines and all the numbers shifting, and it's been an added complication. Um, big picture. Um, there, there's so much going on mm -hmm. here. Can you tell, folks, is, is there a secret to the big board? You know, I honestly think the biggest secret about it is that this is not a native application. It looks like it, right? It's so interactive. You can click into things. It's designed that way, and our designers and our engineering teams work super hard to make that happen. But it, underneath, this is just a website. It's no different than if you were to go to Google or Twitter or any other website. This is web technology that's making this possible. And I think that's maybe not very obvious in this setting. You know, We're seeing it in this really interactive way. But it really shows how we can push web technology to take it beyond just websites. In the same way that we heard how we're taking you know, video graphics and we're pushing them beyond standard applications. We can do the same thing here, which is really cool. And it, it sounds like uh, we have a question, I think. Uh, is Priscilla Thompson standing by? That's right, we are here, uh, and I'm here with Danny Mudvari. He is a senior hoping to become a tech director one day, and Danny's got a question. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, what kind of software and hardware are we able to use as students now to adapt to industry standards by the time we graduate? Absolutely. I mean, so I'm a web developer by trade. So I would say, you know, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, those are my bread and butter. But honestly, I think what it really comes down to is however you want to tell your story. You know, technology is just a tool. As we heard before, it's constantly changing. So you're always going to have to learn new things as you're trying to build whatever it is you're trying to build. So, you know, I wouldn't actually get super hung up on the technology. I would think about what kind of story do you want to tell? How do you want to tell it? And then find the technology that helps you get to that point. Are there any other particular skills or, or if somebody who wants to do mm. what you're doing, be in the world you're in, are there any other particular skills they should be thinking about developing or just things they should be thinking about doing right now to prepare them? I think getting excited and getting passionate about something is honestly really important. You've heard here how hard we work to make all of this come together. That will not happen if you're not excited about what you're working on. So, I mean, if I wanted to get really into the nitty gritty, we use like Mapbox down here to make all these maps happen. We also use D3, which is a JavaScript library that helps us build different charts. Those are all really awesome tools that are in our tool set that we use all the time. But yeah, honestly, getting excited, being passionate about what it is that you want to build is going to take you through and actually make you want to learn all that new stuff versus going out and me telling you, go learn D3. I mean, that's, that's great and all, but it may not be the most compelling way for you to really apply yourself and learn. I, I don't, some of the questions are written for me, but this one I've been told to ask you, and it is, is it to operate the board, mm. are you required to wear khakis? You know, I didn't, I didn't bring really full on khakis, but I felt in the spirit of khakis today. I, you know, we should make it a rule to operate the board. You should have to wear khakis. It's just, it's part of the process. Here's my little secret of, of the big board. There was a time I was using this thing and I wasn't wearing khakis. It was an accident of 2020 and now. <laughs> you can never go back to that. And now that's all that happened. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much though. I, I feel like I understand a little bit more about this now, Sam. Um, like I said, it's, it's, I know this as, 
as a user, but uh, I'm kind of oblivious to what goes on behind the scenes, but I, I really appreciate the work. I know there's a ton of work that goes on behind the scenes, and I really Definitely. appreciate that. Uh, we'll send it back over to you, uh, Brian. Hey, thanks so much, Steve and Sam. Uh, Steve, we know that you have a lot of elections coverage to get to, so we'll catch up with you uh, later on. But Sam's going to stick around. We'll get some questions uh, later on, uh, later in the hour. But again, if you have any questions you want to ask about how we're using all of this cool tech here at NBC Universal News Group, please drop them in the Q&A. We'll make sure to get our panelists to answer them. Well, moving on, though, we've talked a lot about technology in the studios that make our presentation really impressive, but so much reporting is out there in the field. So let's head down to the University of Texas in Arlington, where we just heard from NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson, who's also live alongside Mark Weinstock, who's the vice president of NBC News field operations and engineering. Priscilla, there's some heavy equipment and cool gear that you've got down there. Uh, show us what you're hanging out with. Yeah, we've got a lot of cool stuff here. And as you mentioned, I'm joined by Mark Weinstock, the Vice President of Field Operations and Engineering. And so right out of the gate, I want to talk about drones. UC Arlington has a great program here where they actually teach students how to fly drones and become engineers. Uh, and we've even got a drone shot up here that you all might be seeing throughout the segment. But tell me about how drones are used in our news gathering. Sure. So obviously drones are a huge piece of technology and you're seeing it on screen now and it's a huge thing that's become a major piece of telling stories. We've been flying drones since at least 2014 and continue to do so today. All of our staff photographers are able to fly drones. They're all, they all take the appropriate classes and get certified so that they're following and obeying all the laws and as is governed by the FAA. It, is a, it was absolutely a game changer prior to that. You'd have to rent a helicopter to get these things, which costs a lot of money, as you'd imagine, and uh, you know, can't always find a helicopter where you need it. Um, so this has really changed, I think, especially how we cover things like uh, large-scale stories, disasters, and other things where there's a lot of things happening, and the only way to take in that scene is from above. Yeah, and having the technology is one part of it, but we've got to be able to get this footage back to 30 Rock, back live on our air. And I understand this ginormous truck behind you has something to do with that. Absolutely. So satellite trucks have been with us for a long time, uh, probably at least 50 years. But in the last 30 years, it's been a massive piece of what we use to cover the to cover the news. You take this truck, you can anywhere you can drive it to, and it comes with everything you need. It comes with communications. It comes with video. It comes with audio. It comes with internet. Um, and so it's been a huge tool in getting the job done for covering disasters. But you can't necessarily drive this truck to an island. Um, so when you have to do something like that, you need something a tad bit more portable, which is this. Um, but it's still a lot of cases. It's a lot of things. It's heavy. It takes time to set it all up. You have to build it. Um, and it's not quite as portable. Um, but it gives you many of the same things. Yeah, and the satellite truck is probably what a lot of us are familiar with. We're used to seeing those major breaking news events where there are rows of satellite trucks lined up. But most of the time when I'm doing my live shots, I don't have all of this. We just sort of have this nifty backpack here. And so let's talk a little bit about that. So absolutely, things definitely changed, uh, you know, uh, about 10 years ago when the company named LiveView came to us uh, with a box that could do live cellular communication. And what it was doing is it was taking your, uh, what you basically have in your cell phone, and it took multiple of those things and put it inside of a box, bonded it all together so that it would give you one video output that was capable of streaming a broadcast quality video. Problem with it was it was a 20 second latency. And that is not a very, that's probably untenable when someone asks you a question then it takes you 20 seconds to respond on air. To it's probably, yeah, it's not a little gonna awkward. Work. So that wasn't quite ready. So while that was, uh, while the technology was developing and they were making it better and better, uh, satellite trucks were absolutely growing and growing and growing, more and more and more. And then they kept working on this box and they got that latency down to what was a much more acceptable rate, closer to 1.2 seconds. And once that happened, this became the de facto technology used. There are multiple vendors that are making this of their own version of this box, but everywhere around the United States, certainly all local stations, broadcasters, anyone in their local markets, you're gonna see something similar to this box and internationally as well. Everybody is using bonded cellular technology with a box like this to do live video. And it is slowly replacing the satellite trucks, but as my boss always says, you need to have the right tool for the job and sometimes it's satellite. Right, and we've got a lot of tools. You've got the satellite truck, you've got the live view, but what if you're somewhere where you can't get the truck and you don't have cell service? Are you just out of luck? Well, for a long time, we were carrying this stuff around, and that's a lot of stuff, 11 cases or more. But enter into the world Starlink. 
So Starlink comes along, everybody knows who Elon Musk is and they know what Tesla is, but they may not know what SpaceX is. And SpaceX owns Starlink. And the goal of Starlink is to cover the entire globe with high-speed internet access, particularly to cover areas that don't have internet access at all. As a broadcaster, this is absolutely a game changer because it gives us the possibility to go places that maybe we couldn't go before with large cases. We can take it in one box and bring it out there and get hundreds of meg download speed, still four to six meg upload speed or even more. And we can plug that into our live view unit and now we can go live from anywhere. Um, the thing that's different about this is that- That was this, my next question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that this satellite truck communicates to a satellite in geosynchronous orbit. They've been around for a long time. People have heard of uh, satellites for sure and everybody, people that have direct TV or dish network or other services like that. These satellites operate at geosynchronous orbit, which is about 26,000 miles from the Earth. Wow. When you're moving, so the Earth is moving and the satellite is moving in space and it all appears to happen at the same time. Starlink is doing something extremely different. They're using low Earth orbit satellites. Those are at about 350 miles up. And those are at around where the International Space Station is not quite far away. And the constellation that they're using blankets the globe. You see it now on the screen, how the Starlink satellites are positioned all around the world and you can sort of get that idea of how they're really blanketing coverage so that you can have this service anywhere. They're orbiting at a much faster rate. You're constantly changing satellites all throughout this terminal. It's doing smartly and changing and, uh, and really updating and giving you high speed internet uh, from anywhere you want. They've got a long way to go still, a couple more years before they've totally blanketed the earth. Um, but it's very promising and it looks like a, a big future piece for us. Yeah, no, thanks, Mark. And that was a super interesting sort of overview of our field tech. And I'm sure we've got some seniors here who are going to be going out into the field Woo! after graduation uh, and have some questions about this. So I'll start with you, uh, David Rayo, senior. Tell me, what is your question for Mark? Uh, Mark, uh, how can student reporters, freelancers and startups build and earn the trust of their communities when employing new technologies like drone photography? So it's a great question. I think the biggest thing with drones and one of the things that we have to do is that's how we're different, I think, than maybe the average backyard drone pilot. As a journalist, I think you need to do all of the proper training and we have to absolutely follow all of the rules and all of the laws that are governing it. And if you're obtaining the appropriate permissions, just like here at UT Arlington, we had to go through a process. We don't just come out and put the drone out and say, hey, this looks good. You have to go through a process. The school had a different process than maybe you know, um, right outside the area might have different process. The FAA has restricted areas. So really going through and making sure that you're following the proper procedures so that if somebody comes along and says, hey, who gave you permission to do this? You say, I, I, I went through the university, I obtained the permissions. Never just assume that you can fly wherever you want. Always ask. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and now I'm gonna pop over here to Ron, who is also a senior. And Ron, you actually have your own drone, so you have some experience flying drones for your demo reel and things like that. Tell me uh, a little bit about your question. So Mark, we all know that drones are essential when it comes to news gathering, but what challenges do journalists face when using drones to gather footage? Well, again, I think it's 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 it gets back to those rules. It's a it's 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 playing by the rules and and doing what's appropriate. And we were talking about this earlier. You go out to a natural disaster area, um, things are all been knocked down. Um, we were just there in Hurricane Ian out in the you know the west coast of Florida, um, and you know you're in a disaster zone. Who are we asking permission of? The you know emergency authorities are worried about evacuating people and making sure people are safe. Um, so I think that, but you don't know if you're allowed to fly in this area. So I think there's really, you know, you have to balance that risk and you have to really, you know, those I think are some of the things that really, you know, can affect whether or not you're, you know, um, telling the story in an appropriate way. Yeah. Very awesome points, and I hope you guys learned a little bit from that. Um, and we are going to stick around a little bit longer and answer any other questions you guys might have, give you all a tour of the truck, and I will send it back to you, David. Yeah, Priscilla, actually, it's really funny because I feel like the drone shows you just how big those trucks actually are. But uh, let's go back to Washington, D.C., actually, for a hot second. Uh, back to Howard University, where we've got a question for Mark Weinstock. So we'll go back to Texas after that. Emily Aketa, again, in Washington with that question. Emily? Hey there, Brian. So a lot of the students in here are seniors, some of which are hoping this time next year they'll be working in a newsroom. And one of those is Corinne Dorsey. She's got a question for Mark. Corinne, what would you like to ask? Yeah, so technology is continuing to help how journalism shapes media and how consumers are really getting media. So what are some ways that media technology has helped those endeavors grow in the broadcast and digital realm? 
Well, are you saying to just use drones? Because drones um, are absolutely a, a huge way that you can tell a story. Again, I think, you know, when you're taking the enormity of a situation, we used it um, again in Florida recently. We've used them in Ukraine. We've used them in these other large scenes where there's a, just a mass of people. And the only way to take in that scene to get to fully understand, you know, kind of that, that situation is to see it from above. You know, when you're on the ground, you see a lot of people, you know, you can only see so many people in the shot. But when you go uh, wide and you see it from the air, you can really sort of take in the enormity of what's happening. Um, and that's really important, I think, when you're telling some of these very serious stories uh, where there's a, a large scene or a large amount of people involved. Any other questions? So we've got uh, legal, political, and cultural analyst Dr. Tracy Pearson asking again to Mark Weinstock, what is the ideal set of technical skills you'd like to see, and are there low or no-cost ways of obtaining that training? Mark, your thoughts? So I would just say that I think the most important thing is to get involved, and um, as far as low cost and no cost. So maybe if you're at school, obviously there's a cost. Um, but really being involved and finding your ways to, to get yourself involved, whether it's interning or, um, or just you know, uh, trying to you know, volunteer um, and get involved, that's the, the best low cost way. And as you're learning and as you're developing, you know, see where you can um, meet people, talk to people, have conversations, find out there's a lot of different jobs in here, especially in technology. I think in schools, obviously they're very focused on training on some of the tangible things like camera work, audio work, and things like that, but there are so many skills and some of the things you saw today that you may not be thinking about um, that are also skills um, that can be utilized in the TV industry. And I know when I went to school at the University of Florida, go Gators, that was a sh chef give us a little shade there, but um, go Gators. Um, but anyway, um, you know, when you're there, you, you need to get involved and, and talk to different people because there are so many different jobs. I think that's really the best low cost way is to have a conversation with somebody and see what they do and see if that's interesting. And if they are, then you can take that step further. Very brave, Mark, with the uh, Gators plug there. Uh, thanks so much. Let's come back to the studio here at 30 Rock in New York. Uh, we've got Mark Greenstein, Alex Bassett, Sam Swartz here. Uh, we're going to be fielding some questions from the audience. So maybe we'll try to keep it thematic to just the skill set and, and building something for a career. Uh, we've got a question that's, if you are interested in the tech side, how can you best attain the skills to build a career in the news industry? I'll let anyone take a stab at that for who. I mean, I'll start on the production side. I think Mark is, is exactly right. It's get involved. So if you're in school and your school has, you know, a television station, volunteer your time, be part of it, dig in. If there's a local um, cable company or a local news station, go over there, see what they're doing. I mean, I, I remember one time I was walking by Madison Square Garden, saw a production truck. I knocked on the door and said, hey, show me what happens in here. It's no joke. <laughs> they let you in? They let me in, and, and the Chiron operator at the time, the graphics operator, actually showed me around. Like It was things like that. I was hungry to be in this business, and I took any opportunity I could, talked to anyone I could, to learn as much as I could, and, and I think it's paid off. Uh, we've also got another question from the audience. Uh, Emily McMinn asks, what do you all feel is potentially the next big piece of technology mm -hmm. that will change how we are able to report news on a day-to-day -day basis? Does anyone have a crystal ball here that can? I, I mean, the Starlink's very compelling, right? Like that's accessibility at the greatest of scales. So anyone, anywhere, being able to do anything anywhere is is very unique and then for us to be able to take that in and then use that technology to then compound on we could start doing ar in the field right there's all these opportunities with better connectivity and better storytelling is there anything software wise with the big board that you think could really change the game i mean i think you can apply things like ar even to the big board you know there's so much more data that we could dive into we could think about showing things at the precinct level level that's mm -hmm. something new that we're hoping to do we can just keep pushing a lot of the technology that we already use in these studios even further and coming up with new ideas how to use them. So. And, uh, yeah, and I'll add to that and just say with the big board, I mean, we've talked about a million applications. I know you've been in front of the big board a few times, but you know, in the same way we do uh, politics data, why can't we do business data? Why mm -hmm. can't we bring in weather and make that interactive? And, and I want to go to something Sam said earlier. I mean, it, it's, it's a website, right? And so what we've actually been working on as well is using web graphics. We have a few applications of this for the on-screen displays, meaning that lower third. And where that takes you to is if I'm consuming content on my phone or some digital device, now I can interact with it. So imagine I'm watching election night 
and I can now click the ticker and choose the races I care about in my yeah. own customized ticker, not just the ones that we're sending out. And I think the industry is going to get there fairly quickly, actually. And I think the idea, too, is that it doesn't necessarily have to be some RoboCop technology that we not don't think about. There's a, plenty of data sets, APIs that exist out there that you can plug into technology that we already have that we just maybe haven't done so yet, like some of the finance data, markets data that we can incorporate there. So it's kind of just figuring out how we can use the things that already exist and kind of put them all together. Uh, but let's head back to the University of Arlington, Texas, where Priscilla Thompson's got another student question. Priscilla? Yeah, Brian, this conversation prompting lots of questions from students on the ground here, including Jeanette Pardo here, a junior. And so tell us a little bit about your question. Well, I wanted to ask, um, what is the best way to obtain a drone license and if y'all have any resources for students? Um, so certainly you can go to the FAA's website, um, and that's, you know, one of the best ways, you know, to, to sort of get involved. You certainly can work through some of the tools that the manufacturers have. DJI is a major drone manufacturer, um, and that's the drones that we happen to fly. So there are a lot of tools that are there to help you to learn um, what the, you know, what the requirements are and to make sure that you're following the rules. The controller itself gives you a lot of information, but really the best thing to do is to go online and get those to training tools available from the FAA. There's a lot of information about it. They've done a lot, it's, you know, in the beginning, we were involved, I think we were ahead. We were trying to get as much as we could. They were figuring it out. They figured things out over the years. And so the training programs are abundant now. Yeah, thank you. Brian, uh, back to you. Yeah, I, I have. I feel like I couldn't operate a drone. I, I, I played around with the, with the RC gotcha. cars before, and it just has not worked out well at all. So I try to talk Mark and his team to let me use one. They, <laughs> they know better. They're like, stay away. Apparently a dangerous man, I guess. Um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, technology and kind of the ways that we're using this. It's not only critical to news gathering. It's also helping to save lives. And as we just saw with Hurricane Ian in Florida and the Carolinas, we had the co-host of the third hour of today, Al Roker, working with an elite team of meteorologists turned producers who make up the NBC News climate unit, they've mastered the latest state-of-the-art technology that transforms weather data into powerful visual tools to help tell the story of our climate. Take a look. This is unprecedented. Damaging winds, hail, a tornado possible. We have more severe weather firing up. Al, this looks like a monster storm. This can be the matter of people's lives. What we are seeing today is actually exceeding the forecast. We're now communicating life-saving information. Let's check in with our atmosphere here. Hello, Al. Well, out west, it is hot and it is gonna stay that way for at least 24 hours. Probably got the best weather uh, producers, meteorologists uh, who are working behind the scenes. Hey kids, what's happening? Hey, hey Al. My alarm goes off about four in the morning and I immediately kind of jump in and start looking at the weather for the day for today's show. But Knightley is interested in having you because of the storms. Mm -hmm. The storms will be blowing through probably here. Meteorology is a very male dominated field. It was usually me with a bunch of men and my first year storm chasing, my vehicle was actually called the Man Van plus Catherine. Yeah, we just saw it come across on Twitter that they postponed it for tomorrow. As meteorologists, our world is all data and tech. Heavy showers and thunderstorms into the northeast. What's the future cast look like? The technology uh, that has evolved has allowed us to get information to the viewers, to the public, faster than ever. What you're seeing is uh, this software called TrueView Max, and it's it's a graphic system that not only can show. Um, graphics, of course, but it's also integrating weather data into it. These graphics will load into Al's big touchscreen in, in 1A. So this is raw data, and it's essentially a map of the entire globe. Did you do a temperature map for uh, tomorrow? Anyone can get on their phone and look at the forecast, but it's up to us to tell people why it's important. A weather forecast is a story and we are trying to figure out how to tell that story. We really are a great team. These are degreed meteorologists who are the best in their field. A powerful storm that is going to wreak real havoc. That's Chuck for sure. Al Roker, get out of that unsafe weather there. Thank you. You know, we were talking about this earlier in the hour, just about how weather is a pretty, you know, strong application for a lot of the technology that we're using in part because it's so data driven. All of those maps, all of those, you know, the probabilities for 
what and where we might see certain types of weather conditions. Uh, how much of that is driven together as a team? Because when I think about all the things that we've been talking about here, it's not just technology living in a bubble. It's working with the reporters, yeah. the producers, all the individuals that are part of the climate team, the biz tech team, the health team to, to put together some of those stories. How, how does that conversation kind of go? I mean, look, I think you've heard this throughout the day or throughout this hour. Is that it always starts with the journalism, and that is always the case. So we work with the weather team quite often. So they have a great set of technology that they use not only to, to gain the data but also to show it. But then they'll come to my team and they'll say, hey, how can we amplify that? So again, the example of storm surge or snowfall or things like that. And we literally get everyone in a room and say, how can we better illustrate this so that the viewer understands some of the, the things that we're talking about? Um, but it is rarely just, we'll send an email and we just want a graphic <laughs> that shows snow. There's always yeah. a conversation. And what that means is the artists, the technicians, you know, they have to get into the mind of the journalist. They have to think in the way the journalist does and not just focus on the tech. Um, because they won't be able to properly illustrate that story. Uh, I believe we have another question from the University of Arlington, Texas. Priscilla, uh, another question. Yeah, another question about drones. This one from Kira Robinson, a junior. Hi, yes, I am a junior. I just had a question. How will drones impact the future? Well, certainly, I'm going to speak only to news coverage because I think that obviously drones could be impacting the future in a major way when you look at what other package carriers like Amazon and UPS and FedEx and things are doing with drones. But speaking specifically to news coverage, you know, it's really very much a tool and it's a tool in the toolkit. Um, you're still going to have cameramen and people that you need that coverage on the ground. I don't think it's ever going to totally replace what somebody can do with a camera that can be down here and it's just a different feeling. But that camera up there can provide a perspective on things and say, hey, look, this is what's happening on the ground. But when you take in the enormity of the whole situation and when you see everything that's happening, I think it's just an additional piece. I don't know that I ever see it as a replacement piece to telling a full story. Yeah, but an important additional perspective there. For sure. So, very cool stuff. And Brian, we'll send it back to you. Thanks so much, Priscilla. We've got another question from the audience. This one comes from Michael Tarno. Meta, company formerly known as Facebook, continues to invest in the development of their VR goggles, the Oculus, and also content creation. So question for the floor here. Do you see network news operations diving into the metaverse? I mean, that would be really interesting, but I think it's always going to be a balance between how do you just tell the story the most compelling way? So if that is a great way to tell the story, then yeah, we should totally try and do that. But if it's not a great way to tell the story, then there's probably other options on the table, different technologies that we could lean on to make that happen. Is that is that the metaverse? Is that classified as the metaverse? What we showed yeah, here in I mean, 3A with the rocket? I don't I don't think the technical definition of the metaverse, <laughs> but the, all the technology behind it is the technology that is driving the metaverse. And so it would not be a far leap at all for us to to start doing that to to make a goggle experience if we chose to. Uh, we are getting close to the end of the hour here, but we've got just enough time for some final thoughts. If you have one message to the many people that are tuned in to this NBCU Academy Next Level Summit, what would it be? I'm not going to call on anyone to go first. That's, that's okay, cruel. Okay. So, all right, go ahead. Uh, I would just say expose yourself to as many different industries as possible within the broadcast environment. Like I started in drama, I used to roll around with a puppeteer on the floor, and then now <laughs> I work in virtual reality, right? So there's no one clear path, and just be around really smart people at their jobs. If it's a technical role, if it's a development role, if it's a creative role, spend time with those people. And there's a lot of wisdom that comes from people who've done this for a long time. And it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll echo that and say, you know, learn from the people who have done it and get involved. Um, and, and also think like a storyteller. Don't always think like a technician. Even if your job is extremely technical, at the end of the day, we're all telling stories. And I think that should be the focus. I think it's a really similar theme for me where it's just being excited to learn new things, being excited to learn new technologies and apply them to those stories. That's never going to stop. We're constantly going to have to find new ways to tell the stories that we want to tell. And if you're limited by only knowing what you know right now, you're never going to be able to do the next best thing. So being excited to learn is so important for anyone who's trying to do this type of job. Really, really good words. Pu puppeteering was the yeah, yeah. There was a I professional puppeteer, and I had to lie in the dirt and ro stop him rolling down the hill. Okay, so we got a puppeteer, an opera, opera singer, singer, and Mark. I mean, you got to offer something to the table here. I, I got nothing. Sorry. Come on, something got cool. Tap dancing or I cooking or something. Woodwork. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> 
and can make you the greatest dog crate in the world. <laughs> so there we go. There we go. Thanks so much, Mark. And again, I want to thank our whole panel we've got here. Again, Mark, Alex, Steve, Sam, uh, also our teams, of course, at UTA and Howard for this in-depth look at how new technology is reshaping the news industry. A really fun and engaging panel. Thanks for joining us. We're going to kick it now over to Francis Rivera with what's coming up next at the Next Level Summit. Francis. Hi, Brian. Consider mind blown with everything we've covered so far. Makes me so proud to call this our workplace. All right. A lot of you have got so many questions coming in. We are getting to as many as possible. And of those we can't get to today, keep an eye out for the NBC Academy newsletter for all the questions that we were not able to answer today. Now, coming up a little bit later, you can hear how you'll take your career to the next level when NBC News Now and Snapchat anchor Savannah Sellers interviews NBCU Academy's Yvette Miley. But right now, you get to choose between three exciting breakout sessions. All you have to do is click on the stages icon on the left of your screen to hear from NBC's Gotti Schwartz in Check the Source, focusing on how journalists are using social media to news gather, or NBC's Antonio Hilton with a discussion on breakout careers in media and technology. And if you're interested in sports, stay right here for Getting in the Game, where NBC Sports host Ahmed Farid finds out how tech is transforming the way we view professional Olympic and college sports. And I'll see you back here in just a bit.